Cincinnati. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed when you're ready. Yes, uh, thanks for having me here. Really appreciate it. I'm also an adjunct professor at the George Mason Antonin Scalia Law School. And Senator Eklund, I am going to try that bet tonight. I'm going to find a bar and see if that gets me a free drink. Now, <laughs> Uh, just going to hit on, on two things, really. One is talking about how big platforms are good for small businesses and small voices. And the second is how the existing antitrust law works today and will continue working as we move forward into and through the 21st century. Now, Mr. Ward already laid out some of the important takeaways on the value of big platforms to small businesses. Now, think about small businesses 15, 20 years ago, how would you advertise? You'd go to the local newspaper, you'd go to the radio, you'd go to the television station. That cost a ton of money. It really did. That, that, and you know, there's a famous quote, 50% uh, of my ad revenue is wasted, I just don't know which half. And that's the real problem. Now, 21st century advertising, costs are incredibly cheap. You can do an ad campaign on Facebook, Google, Twitter for $10, $20, and you know if those ads are effective. 77% uh, of people across the country said online ads are valuable to small businesses, and you heard just a couple examples. Uh, one more is uh, Body Boss, which is 12 miles away from here, and uh, they said essentially without online ads, they might as well not exist. And they called upon Congress at the time to pay attention to the benefits of big tech for small platforms. Now, I also mentioned uh, small voices. That's another thing that's often left out of this conversation, how big platforms empower small voices. Now, big voices don't need big platforms. They already have them, right? They've had them for 100 years. But small voices really do need big platforms. Think of the ice bucket challenge from a couple years ago. That's an example of small voices having big impact because of big platforms. Change.org is another one. I, I found one that's uh, particularly apropos. Uh, there's a petition right now going on to bring Phil Dawson back to the Browns. Now, uh, about 10,000 people agree with that so far. But that's a set of voices that otherwise have gone unheard and is empowered by large platforms. Now, turning to the issue of is current antitrust law uh, good and able to deal with 21st century problems? Well, you know, Mr. Zich mentioned and asked, is there a better model than consumer welfare model? I haven't seen one. Well, he's not alone. The Federal Trade Commission had several months worth of antitrust inquiries with antitrust experts from across the political spectrum. And to a person, they all agreed that consumer welfare model, while not perfect, is the best one we have. And essentially, it looks at our consumers being harmed. It's one of the key differentials between us and the European model. In America, we ask, are consumers being harmed? Europe asks, what can we do to prop up unsuccessful and uh, non-competitive businesses? So that's what they look at. In America, you know, we're here in, in the Carl H. Lindner Center. It's all about, you know, what can we do? Pull yourself by, by the bootstraps. The hardest working, the most successful will eventually win out. And that's the American model, and that's what we have today. Now. Uh, Senator Coley, you mentioned uh, you know, uh, how some antitrust concerns don't really play out and they're laughable today. You mentioned Sears. We can add to that, uh, my colleague Senator Del Bianco a couple weeks ago mentioned how we're all worried that Yahoo is going to be the dominant and only player in search and MySpace will be the only social network and of course we laughed at that today. Uh, a couple others, we were concerned back in the late 90s of the merger of AOL and Time Warner and how it would completely disrupt and destroy uh, uh, social fabrics and communication, that's laughable. XM Sirius, we were very concerned that you had the two only players in satellite mar uh, market were going to merge and the concern of that. And my personal favorite, the concern over the merger of Blockbuster Video and Hollywood Videos. And once again, we all laugh at that today. Now, some have come up to say, oh, well, that's the past. We, we can't look to the past because this time it's different. We hear that a lot. This time it's different. That's why you need to do something to change. Well, no, it's not really different. We have essentially a two-sided market, right? You have Facebook or Google, which creates a platform, and they connect sellers, like the small businesses we heard of, and 
buyers. And how do they do that? They create a place that we all want to go. We go to Google to do search. We go to Facebook to share our cat videos. And by doing, going there and creating that marketplace, they pass on these costs. Now, the costs all go to one side. Now, two-sided markets are not unique to the online environment. I used three just getting here today. Uh, the first is I used Expedia to book my hotel room tonight, which connected me with a hotel. I used Lyft to get me from the airport to this, to this building, which connected me with a driver. And finally, I used MasterCard, which connected my bank account to Starbucks so I can go buy a cup of coffee. These are all two-sided markets. Google and Facebook are pretty much the 21st century versions of these. Now, when you're looking at two-sided markets, the Supreme Court just last year decided that you have to look at the benefits of both sides of the market. So you can't just say, well, only one side of the market's impacted. Let's say uh, only advertisers are harmed. No, you have to look at both sides of the market. So let's do like a 12B6 motion to dismiss, right? Let's look at in the light most favorable to the plaintiffs. Well, let's are consumers harmed by the free uses of services like Facebook and Google? No. So what's consumer harm? We get free services. No consumer harm there. Let's look at on the other side, the advertiser side. What's the harm there? Digital advertising prices are at incredibly low cost. As I mentioned earlier, the cost to do an advertisement campaign on Twitter, Facebook, and Google pales in comparison to the cost it would, take, it would be to take out an ad in a newspaper. So advertisers are benefit. So even looking at one side of the market, harm to advertisers, there's none. Look at the other side of the market, harm to consumers, there is none. So it's hard to see how there's even a case under current antitrust law to move against either Facebook or Google. Now, a couple of other things that I just want to hit upon that were raised. Uh, there was a concern about accumulation of data, right? Uh, Somebody's going to have all this data, and uh, that's going to give them incredible market power. Give you an example. Amazon tomorrow could drive up to my house with servers and servers of data, all their consumer data, worth billions of dollars. Kind of worthless to me, right? The real value is in how do you use that data. Now, one of the things about data is it has diminishing returns to investment, right? If I were to say in this room, people wearing blue jackets, well, that would be really useful data. But the more information I get about people, the less valuable it becomes, because maybe all I want to do is sell jackets. And then there's the temporal nature of data. Tomorrow, people wearing blue jackets probably not going to be as valuable tomorrow as it is today. So having lots of data isn't necessarily valuable, just having it. Now, one of the other things that was complained about is Google search and using this data. Well, most search actually doesn't need data, because the ad results are based on what are you searching for. So if I did a search for fishing rods, it doesn't necessarily need to know a ton of information about Carl to show me an ad for fishing rods, right? A uh, couple of other things. Uh, there's concerns. Google is the largest player in the digital advertising market with a whopping 32%. So under any antitrust analysis, it's hard to make an argument that 32% is market power. Uh, number two is Facebook, and number three, which is quickly moving up the chain, is Amazon and 10%. Even if you put all three together, you're still only at 62%. That means there's 38% of the market still open outside of those three players. Um, and lastly, one of the things that we all started with at the beginning was a discussion of what is the market, right? That's how we're supposed to start this. Well, the market for search, we've talked about DuckDuckGo. Uh, one of the things we haven't talked about are the other searches. So if I'm looking for a restaurant tonight, I'm not going to go to DuckDuckGo. I'm not going to go to Google. I'm going to go to Yelp, or I'm going to go to TripAdvisor, or Urban Spoon, or something like that. It's going to give me star ratings of restaurants. If I'm looking for a contractor for my house, I'm going to go to Angie's List and do a search there. Uh, and likewise, you have searches for hotels. I can go to Expedia, uh, uh, Trip, uh, TripAdvisor, uh, Booking.com, a host of others. So clearly the market on search is pretty robust. Let's look at social. Now I had to ask my son for some of these because he's younger and hipper than I am, but you have Nextdoor, that's local news. You have Snapchat, you have TikTok, you have Discord, you have Twitch, you have YouTube, you have LinkedIn. So the argument that there's no competition in the social network also doesn't fit the model. 
So just leaving you with a couple of thoughts that even in the best light for the plaintiffs, I don't see a case to be made that there is antitrust. I don't see a problem in the market since advertising has never been cheaper and consumers are benefiting. And of course, the benefit to small businesses and small voices from big platforms. And with that, I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Sabo. And uh, you came in to us today from where? Uh, Washington, D.C. From Washington, D.C. Well, thank you for coming so far for such a, uh, a presentation. We're grateful to you. Are there questions for this witness? Senator Coley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, some of those, the uh, merger between the Brontosaurus and the Stegosaurus, you know, really uh, not going to affect a lot of us today. Uh, Milton Friedman always pointed out that uh, when it comes to regulation, that the uh, regulated sooner or later become the regulators. And, uh, and uh, he always pointed out the inefficiency of, of trying to regulate so many of these kind of things with other than the marketplace. Um, you know, any thoughts on that as, as far as as we step forward and, and look at this in, elect, in, in a legislative light that uh, we're just going to exacerbate the problem? Yeah, great question. One of the things that you've heard from many of the FTC commissioners, which include the Democratic ones, uh, like uh, Commissioner Chopra, is concerns about how government action can actually erect barriers to competition. Uh, we touched on privacy earlier as a good example. So tough privacy laws. Guess what? If I'm a new company, a new startup, I, I've got to hire really expensive lawyers like uh, Mr. Zitch over there to help me figure out how to comply with the privacy laws. I can't do that. So what does it do? It locks in incumbents. And then we heard concerns about regulatory capture. And that is that is always a concern. So once you now have regulators and new laws, at the end of the day, they are most likely going to benefit the entrenched incumbents. Now, I'm not against getting government involved when government needs to get involved, when there are clear examples of abuse of power in a market. But that's just not here. Now, one of the things I do want to talk about, Senator Coley, that you did touch upon, which is transparency with respect to um, helping to make things clear. Even if people don't read the term service or privacy policies, and look, I used to write them, and I don't read that many myself, there are groups out there that do. And what they can do is compile scorecards so, and shine light on who is, let's say, throttling. That's an example that came up. And there are groups out there that will do that and shine a light on it. So with the transparency, even if you or I may never actually read the documents, there are groups out there that will shine a light on it. And then that information gets out. And now you have market pressure for companies to act accordingly. Mr. Chairman. Proceed. So and then according to the other testimony we got today, so if somebody actually did that, then the group found out that, oh, you're throttling Netflix then they could very inexpensively, the competitor could very inexpensively send a marketing campaign targeted right to the Netflix company going, do you know that XYZ internet service provider is throttling? And if you come to our client, and, and they could very quickly and very inexpensively take on that competition and, and swing over those customers to their benefit. Well, if that's, if yeah. we leave the market the way it is and we don't step into this. Yeah, that, that's exactly it, especially with things like search where uh, the, the stickiness just isn't there. I mean, when I load up a, a browser in, let's say, Mozilla, it immediately gives me four or five different search options from which to choose. The stickiness isn't there. With respect to Facebook, stickiness is kind of there because some of my friends are there. But by the same token, we saw it with MySpace, and we're seeing it with the migration away from some social networks, that when you provide a better product, people will go use that better product. And if I want local news, I'm going to go to next door because they're telling me exactly what's going on in my community right then and there. Final. And, Finally. And to that point, uh, Google was not the first search engine. I believe they were the 16th or somewhere around there, and yet they dominate the marketplace now because it's a better product, yeah, according to most consumers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think Google just hit its 21st birthday, so it, it's old enough to drink. Congratulations, Google. Uh, but that's exactly it. How did they, how did they win? Or how are they winning? Because once again, Yahoo's a good example. Nothing lasts forever. Sears is a good example. Nothing lasts forever. How, why are they winning? Because right now they're creating the best product out there. And if somebody else comes along, like DuckDuckGo is growing incredibly fast, people will go there. 
Anything else for Mr. Sabo? Seeing nothing, we thank you very much for your engagement and uh, look forward to your continued uh, availability as necessary to further elucidate these issues. Happy to come by anytime. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We will next call.